A few major mistakes can be attributed to the broken supply chain and the rising cost of goods and services that we experienced in 2021 and moving forward into 2022. Today, we're going to take a look at how we got to this point, how it's affected us, and why it's resulted in such drastic price increases. The three mistakes made were, one, wrongly predicting consumers would stop spending, two, a system for shipping and receiving that already had cracks broke wide open, and number three, mergers and acquisitions in certain industries are going to make it easier to keep their prices higher in the future. If this is your first time watching our channel, please click subscribe down here on the bottom right. And if you click that little bell next to it, you'll be notified of all of our videos as they come out. First, the wrong assumptions. The first thing that really screwed things up after the first COVID lockdowns in early 2020 was a wrong assumption about how consumers would use the products through the rest of the year. Just as consumers went panic shopping, buying every last piece of toilet paper that they could find, the manufacturing industry leaders made a panic assumption. They assumed that since people were getting really sick at an alarming rate, fewer people would be out and about spending money. So they slowed down production to not have an overabundance of inventory stuck in their lots and facilities. And they were right. We saw factories shutting down because people were getting sick. Texas saw snow and some of the coldest weather they've ever seen. I mean, one of the buildings at the Texas train factory that makes our HVAC equipment had the roof collapse in on itself, taking out production altogether. Sick people meant fewer people working on the production lines, which meant whatever was happening wasn't working as smoothly as usual. The general population was confused and worried about how life would unfold and if we would ever get through this. Americans saved trillions of dollars during the shutdown. Instead of spending on spring vacations and personal experiences, people had to stay in their homes for a whole month or even longer. Restaurants, theaters, hotels, florists, gyms, cruise lines, and spectator sports were forced to shut down for quite a while. Only essential service workers were allowed to be out in the community. So money wasn't being spent there either. But after the restrictions were lifted, China first and later the U.S. and U.K., people started spending like crazy on electronics and furnitures for their new home offices and homeschooling. For us, that meant people were willing to spend money on home improvements like heating and cooling. Since they would be home more, they needed to be more comfortable. And other DIY and contractor projects were also on the upswing. Next up is the broken system of shipping and receiving. Products have been made overseas where labor costs are lower. We all know that. And because of this, American companies have been able to provide consumers with products at affordable prices, even when they're shipped from thousands of miles away. When the supply chain crisis arrived on American shores, folks living near major ports saw cargo ships more backed up than ever before. Floating off major ports were over 100 ships at a time, unable to unload. $25 billion worth of raw material and goods stranded at sea. And that's not just a U.S. problem. Hamburg, Antwerp, Rotterdam, and Shanghai ports suffer the same massive backlogs and congestion. When everything is flowing right, that makes for cost savings. It also exposes us to, if something goes wrong at these small number of choke points, things go wrong in a big way. And if there's a problem in one piece of the supply chain, it ripples right through to the end buyer. Almost all goods are shipped across the oceans, and more than half of those goods are transported on container ships. That's because traveling by ship is cheaper than flying it. Air freight is faster, but they're smaller, so it can be way more expensive. Container ships have gotten very large. From handling a few hundred or a few thousand containers, they now handle tens of thousands, causing many shipping facilities needing to expand. For example, the Panama Canal has been the primary route to keep our goods flowing from the Atlantic to the Pacific and vice versa. But once the ships started getting bigger, the canal needed to expand to allow those bigger boats to pass through. And in 2016, they finished that expansion. But just four years later in 2020, a lot of ships have gotten even bigger, too large for the Panama Canal. 
In Egypt, the Suez Canal is the other major shipping thoroughfare. In fact, it's the oldest. It cuts the travel distance from China to Europe by 3,000 miles. This way, ships didn't have to go around Africa. Trillions of dollars pass through there every year. But remember during COVID in March of 2021, when commerce came to a screeching halt, when the 1,300-foot-long massive cargo ship named Ever Given got a little cockeyed and ran aground? That massive cargo ship carrying over 18,000 containers worth of about a billion dollars of goods and raw materials halted all passage through the canal. Ever Given couldn't have crashed in a worse place, right in front of the, one of the busiest shipping passages. That accident froze $60 billion worth of international trade. And that one ship blocking one canal during a pandemic like COVID threw a wrench at economies across the world. LA loads and unloads over half a million containers every month. That's over 6 million a year. It's the biggest port on the West Coast. It basically runs like a city because it employs over 100,000 people trying to make it run like clockwork. For a long time now, China has shipped more containers to the U.S. than the U.S. sends back to China. They either get sent back empty or full of goods, but it's definitely less than what China sends here. When China lifted its restrictions, the U.S. was still on lockdown, and containers started backing up at U.S. ports. The low workforce levels meant fewer people to reload and return those containers and get them back overseas. After U.S. lockdowns, we started buying an enormous volume of goods, which meant more containers and more ships. Everyone is feeling the pressure, including the crane operators and the truckers, because the ports are stuffed to the till with containers. By taking up space in the U.S., containers make port operations bulky and even less efficient because they get in the way. So this turns into a situation where the truckers can't get enough containers out of the port and the cranes can't get enough containers into the port. Whereas two or three years ago, it would be about a 20 to 30 minute turnaround. Now it takes truckers who take those containers and deliver them to distribution centers an hour just to get to the harbor gate. Then another three or four hours sitting and waiting for their container to get put on their trailer. Companies that paid $10,000 three or four years ago are now paying $30,000 to $40,000 for that same container today. That cost ultimately gets passed down to the consumer. Next up, let's talk about materials under the most pressure. Sheet metal, semiconductors, aluminum, and other materials suddenly became scarce. So scarce that an 8-foot 2x4 went from $2.50 to $10 overnight. Since then, it has come down, but that doesn't mean it will for other commodities. As the U.S. begins to reopen, some trends like lumber and tends home remodeling are slowing down. That DIY pullback is helping to cause a correction in the lumber market. Since peaking at $1,515 per thousand board fee on May 28th, which was 300% above its pre-pandemic price, the cash of the lumber is back down to about between $700 and $1,000. And that begs the question, why isn't steel seeing a similar correction? According to MarketWatch and Forbes.com, in July 2021, steel prices were up 200% since the pandemic started. And people wondered when the bubble would pop. At that time, it was up to $1,825, $1,943 in September of 2021, and that's the highest we saw it get. Before the pandemic, it sold for between $500 and $800. But supply and demand justified the increase. Some people don't think the price of steel will hit its all-time high until about mid-2022. In my field, not only were there fewer sheet metal and semiconductors for manufacturers to pull from, but the price of that equipment that they were selling us went up by 25% in 2021. Another price increase of 10% is going to happen in January of 2022. And who knows how many more increases that they're going to have in 2022. Let's take aluminum for example. Aluminum is one of the most common metals found in the Earth's crust. But turning that raw element into the finished product involves a long process. It's mined in Australia, Guinea, China, and Brazil. And it's refined into aluminum oxide, which is then turned into aluminum metal. And the final hardening element, magnesium, which also comes from China, 
is short because of rolling blackouts that have been happening there since the major increases in production after the lockdown. Those power cuts have intermittently stopped factories from producing items essential for the West. Think of all the things made with aluminum. Cars, electronic devices, refrigerant lines for HVAC systems. When there's a shortage, all those manufacturers are chasing the same product. That's why in September 2021, aluminum hit a 13-year high in price. Now let's talk about sheet metal. An article I read on Forbes.com quoted a sheet metal manufacturer in the Midwest that said that they're going to run out of inventory on some jobs by mid-January 2022. They just can't get enough to build any inventory or safety stock. Another manufacturer said that it doesn't matter how much money that they're willing to pay for steel, there's none available to be had beyond their everyday requirements until late January or February. Then there's just normal everyday wear and tear that happens during operation. A Canadian steelmaker said that they had to shut down for an extended time when their number two caster failed. That same mill is also set to take down one of its furnaces for two to three weeks for scheduled repairs. The two outages alone could leave that mill with no steel making for a few weeks. Steel, which is heavily needed in the oil and gas industry, is experiencing an all-time high in demands as the economy reopens. So along with furnaces and package units, which never really tapered off, these other industries began picking back up. That's why prices are not set to go back down anytime soon. Here's one more big note that I read about mergers and acquisitions. And this is a big point to make. Two major acquisitions by steel-making titan Cleveland Cliffs buying AK Steel and U.S. Steel buying ArcelorMittal have essentially made the steel industry a duopoly. That firm grip by Cleveland Cliffs and U.S. Steel Corporation on the market leaves them with little incentive to increase production. After all, creating more supply would only mean that their prices would fall. And with the limited number of steel and sheet metal makers, they can just keep their price as high as they want by limiting production. The world has definitely changed since early 2020 when COVID started. Things are starting to settle back down, but it's going to be a long time until things get back to the way it was before. And when it does get back, processes and procedures at shipping facilities and our major ports are going to need to be updated. Reliance on semiconductors from overseas needs to be eliminated when they can be made just as easily here in the United States. Sure, they might be a little bit more expensive, but at least we'll be able to get them. If this is your first time watching our channel, please click subscribe down here on the bottom right. And if you click that little bell next to it, you'll be notified of all of our videos as they come out. Thanks so much for watching, and we'll see you on the next video. You're watching Fox Family Heating and Air. Don't forget to subscribe. And check out more of our videos by clicking on the right side of the screen.